So I have a second homework assignment for you, my friends, because I know that you love homework. Netflix just made this uh, book by Maury Terry. It's called The Ultimate Evil, The Search for the Sons, note the plural, of Sam. My friend Doug Kramer was found unresponsive in his Los Angeles home on December 11th of 2023. His passing came as a shock for many of us, his friends, and his viewers here on YouTube from his channel Dazed but not confused. Doug was only 50 years old at the time of his passing. And personally, I have some suspicions about his actual passing, but that's a story for another day. You see, Doug had grown up in the Church of Scientology. His father brought Scientology into his life when he was about nine years old. If you know Doug's story, you know that he resisted Scientology for a very long time, knowing in his gut that there was something really, really wrong about this belief system. However, in his 20s, Doug did become involved with the church and became a pretty high-ranking member of the church, making it to OT level three. When fatefully one day in his 30s, in about a 20-minute time span, Doug realized that he was a part of something very nefarious. Within that 20 minutes, Doug's life completely changed. He went from having a family, having a church, having a very successful career as a Hollywood actor in soap operas and in many TV shows to walking away from everything. His whole life fell apart. In this tailspin to total destruction, Doug decided that he wanted to figure out why. Why was he able to be fooled by this disastrous cult, this cult that uses hypnosis and mind control? And what Doug discovered was that Scientology, allegedly, is part of a bigger problem, a bigger problem in our greater world that, yes, involves mind control and hypnosis. After over a decade of working on his own research, as well as healing himself from the destruction that came into his life, Doug made it his mission to expose this to the public. In Doug's research, he found connections between Son of Sam, Charles Manson, and the Progressive Church and Scientology, as well as our governmental systems around the world. He created a series called Growing Up in a Secret Society, and in Season 2, he had a couple of episodes labeled the Summer of PsyOps. Before Doug's passing, we had decided that we were going to re-examine Doug's research. I was going to do some research into these topics, as well as him represent on my channel all of his findings. And again, unfortunately, he passed away before that could happen. Life. Because this is such a huge, huge, vast thing to look at, we are obviously going to have to divide this up into many different parts. And so today, we're going to be looking at part one. It took me a long time to figure out how I was going to organize this, but I think I found a really great place to start. Because as any good story starts, we have to go back to the beginning. And for me, this beginning for this particular story starts in 1858 with the birth of a man named Samuel Untermeyer. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, such a very, very big, big, huge thank you to our Patreons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, this work would not be possible. And I am so, so grateful for everything that you guys do for me. All right, guys, with that being said, let's get started with part one of the Satanic Cult. Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. 
Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Claiming members of a satanic cult helped in the murders of six people. I could feel a force pulling me into the darkness. This group is all over the country. So we devoted to bringing on the end of the world. On August 10th of 1977, David Berkowitz was arrested for the son of Sam Killings in New York City. He famously claimed that he got his orders from a demon-possessed dog belonging to his neighbor, Sam. In the meantime, a journalist named Maury Terry decided that something wasn't quite right about this whole situation. For starters, there were multiple different witness eyewitness accounts that described very different looking people. He was very suspicious of everything the police were telling the public regarding this whole horrific summer. Mari Terry would go on to spend 10 years deeply, deeply investigating this case. He would also start correspondence with David Berkowitz. After 10 years of work, Mari Terry released his book, The Ultimate Evil. And in the mid 90s, David Berkowitz would go on to admit to being a part of a violent satanic cult. And all of his murderous acts were actually part of satanic rituals. He would go on to say that Maury Terry was right. And there were multiple sons of Sam. Maury Terry believed that there was a dubious secret society in New York called the Heretic Order of the Golden Dawn. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn had members such as Aleister Crowley. There were also ties to people like L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn also allegedly had another pretty famous member. This was a guy named Samuel Untermeyer. And it was at Untermeyer Park that David Berkowitz claimed his satanic cult would do their horrific rituals. Now we will be getting into David Berkowitz and the actual son of Sam's killings, the, the details of that case in part two. There will also be an upcoming separate episode just solely on Jack Parsons. I'm telling you guys, this stuff is so, so intense and there's just so much of it. But again, for today, we're going to start with the beginning because these things don't just pop out of nowhere. Now, you could say that the beginning goes way back in time to the start of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which I have researched into, but that would just be way, way, way too much. You could say the beginning starts with Aleister Crowley, but again, we want to specifically look at the Son of Sam, which goes back to Untermeyer Park, which goes back to Samuel Untermeyer, who was a contemporary of Aleister Crowley. So that is where we are going to begin with this specific story. Now, in fairness, we're not quite sure when Untermeyer was born. We know the year was definitely 1858, but some records say his birthday is March 2nd. Some records say his birthday is March 6th. Some records say his birthday is in June. But regardless, he was born in 1858 in Lynchburg, Virginia. Samuel was the son of two German Jewish immigrants from Bavaria. Now, Bavaria is a state in Germany. It's the southeastern part of Germany. We've talked a lot about Bavaria on this channel and some of our historic deep dives. But nonetheless, his parents immigrated to the United States in the 1800s from Germany. 
making Samuel and his siblings what we call first-generation American. They settled again in Lynchburg, Virginia, where Samuel's dad became what they called a planter. Now, I'm not super familiar with this term, so I did look into what this term means. It basically sounds like he was kind of a, a plantation either owner or worker. I guess plantation comes from the term planter because this is what I found in my research. According to some sources, uh, this was a racial and socioeconomic caste that relied heavily on cash crops like tobacco, sugarcane, cotton, coffee, etc. This caste grew in the 16th and 17th century in the United States or what was to become the United States this started to create the American gentry class. This was obviously a group of people that relied heavily on slave labor. So it does seem that Samuel's father either owned a plantation or worked on a plantation. Yes, granted, they did not immigrate until the 19th century. So I don't know if he was just working for a plantation or if they came from Germany and purchased a plantation and became plantation owners. There are some other podcasts out there that I will link down in the description box below that do they do speculate um, about the um, the family coming from Germany. We, we often think of immigrants as being maybe poor, and a lot of immigrants immigrants are poor, and they're coming to the United States for a fresh new start. And this could have very well been the case for the Untermeyer family. However. If they did purchase a plantation when coming here to the United States, then they obviously were coming from a, a lot of, of financial wealth. And, and that's kind of where I'm leading in my speculation, given what I now know about Samuel Untermeyer. But I just want to make that clear that that's, that's only my speculation that they came to the United States with a bunch of money already and kind of nestled themselves within the American uh, political system. You see, because Untermeyer's father, Isadora, joined the Civil War. So the Civil War breaks out a couple years after Samuel is born. He was born in 1858 again, so two years after he was born, all of a sudden, we're in this big war. And his father joined the Confederate side for, he fought for the Confederacy, for the South. And um, after the Civil War, his father passed away in 1866. So like a year after the Civil War was over, when Untermeyer was only eight years old. Now, after his father's death, we see Untermeyer's mother and Untermeyer himself and his siblings up and moved to New York City. Now, again, this was proposed on another podcast that I will link below, where for this day and age, for a woman, a widow with young children, just to be able to up and leave Virginia and move to New York City, especially after the devastations of war, means that, that we can probably assume there was a good bit of money behind this family. So again, that brings me back to my speculation that when they came here to the United States, they were already pretty self-sufficient. But nonetheless, the Untermeyers brought themselves to New York City where they ended up creating a life for themselves. Samuel Untermeyer was a very smart kid. He ended up going to Columbia Law School where he graduated with a law degree when he was only 20 years old. Now, I know back in these days, things were different with education. So kids could or people rather could get their degrees faster than we get them today. But by 20 years old, he had passed the bar and was practicing law in New York. And this is where things get even more interesting because this is where we see Untermeyer start to become a very, very, very powerful person in his own right. He ends up creating this law firm with his little brother, a kid named Maurice, a friend from law school named Louis Marshall, and Randolph Guggenheimer. Now, the Guggenheimer name is a very, very big name here in the United States. It's kind of like one of those Rockefeller or Rothschild names. Everybody knows who the Guggenheimers are. And it is alleged that Samuel Untmeyer was the Guggenheimer's cousin. You see where I'm going with this? Now, again, I don't like to speculate too much about people in the nefarious cult of the Cabal with their family bloodlines, because I do know that 
as a human being that anybody born into any type of family really has free will. And so we, we can't judge people right away just based off of their last name, right? Judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin, as Martin Luther King. King Jr. said, but we can also say, judge them by the content of their character, not by their family's last name. But in this situation, it does appear to me from the evidence given that Samuel and his cousin were probably not up to any good. And I speculate again that these power, these powerful families, he came over to the United States under the guise of being a Jewish immigrant. He was Jewish, but you know there was a lot of tension building already in the mid-19th century against the Jewish people. So that was kind of his guise, even though his family was already very rich and powerful. And he ends up working his way into the political system of the United States, which we're going to get through, through his law firm. In fact, at this time... His law firm was literally the most powerful law firm in New York City for 45 years. Untermeyer specialized in corporate law with a specialty in the stock market regulation, government ownership of railroads, and advocated for legal reform. And just a fun fact about old Untermeyer is he was the first attorney in recorded history to make a million dollars on a single case. We're talking a million dollars in the early 20th century. Dude was powerful. Dude also believed in what they called the progressive era. That was kind of the era of the time. He was a huge, huge proponent for things like big government. He really, 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 really wanted Big Brother to be watching you and me. Sounds like a modern day Mark Zuckerberg. He was also very, very, very big in the Democratic Party, serving as a delegate for the Democratic National Convention from 1932 to 1936. Untermeyer was also a Zionist. I'm not going to get too much into that here i i just that's a dangerous topic to touch on and you guys could do your own research into that what that means and the po political implications behind it but that's all we're going to say about that right now in this episode <laughs> he also was a huge practicer of eugenics he really believed in the power of eugenics which is something we're seeing here really play out in, in our time in 2024 Basically, eugenics believes that there were or believes that there are like superior races and that these inferior races need to be basically weeded out of our society through things like this, through other practices that I can't say on YouTube, like the removal of, of babies from a woman's body. Very racist, extremely, extremely racist, not something that I support or I think any of you guys watching support. Now, Untermeyer was a huge uh, proponent and a supporter of the Federal Reserve. Um, I've talked a lot about the Federal Reserve on this channel, which is not, even though it, the name is Federal Reserve, it's, it's not really a part of our government. It's actually a private bank. They founded it on Jekyll Island right off of the coast of Georgia. I have spoken about that a lot, especially on my early days here on YouTube. Some of those videos might have been taken down, but you can probably find some of them if, they are, if they're still up in the conspiracies playlist here on my channel. Very, very nefarious, very dubious. I mean, the writing's on the wall with this guy. In fact, this guy actually buddied up with Woodrow Wilson, who was the president at the time where the Federal Reserve was put into play in the United States. And I actually do have family connections to Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's wife is um, related to one of my mom's really good friends whom I've had come on this channel before. And Woodrow Wilson kind of got himself into a very sticky situation because it appears, allegedly, that Woodrow Wilson was kind of caught having or trying to start an affair with this other woman. And this other woman kept all of her love letters from Woodrow Wilson. I mean, why would you not? I mean, I'm a girl. I mean, I, I haven't gotten a love letter in a really long time. I freaking love that stuff. Like, I love getting handwritten letters from people, like, with their not typed, not text, 
not emailed, but like actual penmanship mailed to me. I mean, I would save all of that shit. Even if the guy and I had broken up, I'm going to save it because that stuff is so powerful. I think most women do save that stuff. I love getting love letters and I love getting flowers. That makes me so happy. I'm a cheap date. I'm not really into going to fancy places, but send me flowers and write me a freaking love letter and I'm yours. So I don't blame this woman for saving these letters, but as fate would have it, Woodrow Wilson ended up becoming the president and something happened within her family. And so she basically used these love letters as um, blackmail. So she basically was trying to blackmail our president and used Samuel Untermeyer as the liaison between her and Woodrow Wilson. Here's here. Untermeyer was this really big attorney, one of the most powerful attorneys in New York City. So he had fame and he had power. And so he brought this blackmail to the president. I mean, I'm like, oh, you like knock on the White House door and be like, yo, bro. This woman who is my client is going to release all your love letters to her if you don't give her $40,000 to help get her family member out of a sticky situation. And of course, at this time, $40,000 was a huge amount of money. And so Wilson was like, oh shit, I don't have $40,000 to give her and I can't have these love letters exposed because here I am, the president of the United States who has a first lady. I mean, this would still even be a scandal. I mean, think about Bill Clinton. Like this is still a scandal in our modern times. This was even more of a scandal back then. And so Untermeyer, again, he wasn't stupid. Untermeyer had a shit ton of money. So he was like, I'm going to blackmail this guy too. He's like, you know what, Wilson? Prez, I'm going to do you a solid. I'll pay her the $40,000 to not expose these love letters if you do me some solids in our governmental system. And Woodrow Wilson was like, Sounds like a plan, my friend. So at this point, Untermeyer basically owned the government because he paid off Woodrow Wilson's blackmailer. Y'all, they don't teach us this shit in school. This is why we understand. I mean, this is just a pure example of like why po politicians and government officials are freaking owned by the people who blackmail them. This is like honeypotting someone before honeypotting was actually a thing. So we have this Zionist who is pro big government, who practices eugenesis, believes in eugenics, um, wants total control. Again, big government means total control over the population. He's now puppeting the president of the United States. He's behind the Federal Reserve System. And we now have, from Mari Terry's research many decades later, saying that this guy was also involved in this satanic cult with Aleister Crowley. Now, what's interesting is that Aleister Crowley was living in New York City during the time of Samuel Untermeyer. So that brings more uh, plausible uh, a reality to, to the fact that they were probably cohorts in some very satanic goings on with black magic. That might sound funny the way I'm saying this, but as you guys know, we're on YouTube. And so I'm trying to get my point across being as creative with the wordings as I can. I think you guys know know what I mean. Hopefully you know what I mean. If you don't know what I mean, listen, child, if you don't know what I'm talking about, there's a lot more videos that you need to be watching before you're watching this video. <laughs> Go back and watch more of the videos, videos first because if you don't know what I'm talking about when I talk about a satanic cult puppeting the world, Bless your heart. That's all I've got to say is bless your heart. But in 1886, Sam purchased an estate that was previously owned by the 25th governor of New York, Samuel Tilden. This was a 150-acre estate in New Yonkers, New York, adjacent to the Hudson River. He developed elaborate gardens and made this his primary residence. He called this 
Greystone. This estate was very Persian in design. It had something that resembles the theory of the hanging gardens of Babylon. And if you've been on this channel for a while, you must know that when I figured that out, when I found that out, that he tried to design his gardens after the hanging gardens of Babylon, I was like, is it Babylon? Because if you looked at some of the Tartarian maps, it would make the southeastern United States Egypt. And the northeastern part of the United States fucking Babylon. So ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, my friends. Did he design it after this mysterious hanging gardens of Babylon? Which is probably a conspiracy we should eventually cover on this channel. If you don't know about it. Or was this already the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and he just plopped himself down there? Who knows? But interesting. There were strange sculptures of winged lions and Roman pillars that were dated to be about 2,000 years old. Many people believe that he had these Roman pillars brought over from Italy to place them on his estate. Like 2,000-year-old Roman pillars. But again, my friends... Were they brought from Italy? <laughs> or were they already here? Again, if you're new to these conspiracies, I would suggest looking into Tartaria to look at this alternative geographical map that a lot of people are proposing could potentially be the real map, meaning that nothing we where we think all these locations are aren't actually where where they are i do know that the world's fair which happened in chicago at the end of the um 19th century was allegedly created in order to dismantle a lot of old roman architect that was here in the united states so Riddle me that, Batman. Riddle me that. We also know that there were many strange altars on this estate. There was something called a carriage house that had lots of rituals taking place when Untemeyer was alive and going forward into modern times. And there was also something called Devil's Cave. Now, apparently Devil's Cave has now been completely demolished and taken down. I think they probably just moved it. If you want my honest opinion, that, that again, it's just my opinion. It could have been dismantled, but since when are they ever going to dismantle something so powerful as a devil's cave on the property of someone who was part of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn? There was also temples with Medusa's head and a temple of love with a thousand steps. And at the bottom, it was alleged that there were hidden nooks. Like you could like lift the stairs up and go into these hidden tunnels where there were benches where you could do like love spells and rituals. The whole freaking estate was basically one big temple where they could perform rituals in Untermeyer's day and moving forward into the son of Sam. Because you see, upon Untermeyer's death, he left the state to the city of New York. And that's when it became a park. Now, over time, the park went into dis disrepair. Like, it was just chaos. There was a lot of graffiti everywhere. It was not very well kept up. But again, a lot of the original altars, we know, were part of the original architecture design. So it wasn't like these groups, these satanic cults came in and were just like, here's a park we can use. We're going to create these altars. No, they were already there. And there was a researcher that I listened to. Again, I'll tag that that episode down in the description box below if you, so you guys can hear, hear for yourself. Somebody who's obviously from the area. I've been to the area, but I'm not, I'm not up Southern. I'm not from New York. So it's interesting to hear somebody from this area who grew up, who was alive during the son of Sam fiasco, 
to recount his research with his own memories of this park and what was happening in the 1970s. I was not alive for the Son of Sam murders. I was born in 1983, so I just missed it. I actually just asked my boyfriend before filming because he's 11 years older than me. He was born in 1972. So I asked him if he remembers um, the Son of Sam. And he was very young when Son of Sam happened, but he remembers. Like, that's how big of a news story it was. He re he remembers this whole fiasco. And so this guy in the podcast listed below talked about how where this park is located, it's not necessarily hidden. Now, yes, it's very derelict in nature at this time. Again, a lot of graffiti. It wasn't a park that you would go to during this time for a night's family's outing, right? It was, again, it was derelict. But it's not hidden. You know, it's not like you're going to go there and, and, and like do some blood sacrifices and not fear that someone can see you. It's, it's like in Yonkers. So this guy said there had to be a reason why they picked this location. And the reason is from our research and from Laurie Terry's research, this was a prime location created specifically for this type of black magic by the original Sam. Sons of Sam. There's going to be lots of Sams in this, guys. But let me let me just go ahead and tell you that there's lots of Sams. But Samuel Untermeyer, son of Sam, or as we now know, sons, sons plural of Sam. Now, again, Untermeyer died in 1940. So he was not around in his physical body um, for the 1970s when this, this whole thing happened. But when we're looking at occult practices, as we saw with like Rasputin, as we've seen with a lot of these big characters, there is a worship of humans. There is a, a wanting to harness the energy of these magnetic humans that were pioneers and, and great crusaders of this dark shit. And on top of that, it's not just Sam Untermeyer himself, in my opinion. It's also the land of his estate. Again, look at all that's on there. We have winged lions. We have pillars from the from Rome, from Italy, from the Roman Empire. We have um, hanging gardens of Babylon. So all these altars with Medusa's head, you know, I, I don't think that Samuel Untermeyer, like, in my opinion, like, picked this estate, this real estate, and was like, bring it all to me, boys, let's build it here. I think he picked this estate because I think this is where this, this shit was happening originally, and he just decorated his gardens around it. When it was private property, it was pretty easy to hide this, but then if it became a public park, we now have this narrative of them importing stuff to his property but no 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 my friends i think it's actually the other way around i think that this shit was already here and that is again that is just my opinion that is my assumption based in my speculation based off of my own research you're welcome to think differently than me but again i i just think it's 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 a multi-layered reason as to why they were doing shit here it was owned by Sam Untermeyer, who obviously was a pretty big wig because he was puppeting Woodrow Wilson when the Federal Reserve came in. He was for control, for big government. And also, he purchased the land because the land itself was a portalish area that had huge significance to all the goings-on, the shenanigans of this world in, in, in general. And I think that this modern-day cult was the extension of that cult that was like, we got to go here because Papa don't preach. Like, we got to go here because this is where shit kicks off. We got to go here because here is where the magic happens. Does that make sense? In my head... That makes sense. Let me know if you think differently. We also know in the 1970s that people that lived in the Yonkers area complained often that there were torches of light in Untermeyer Park where they heard very, very, very weird chanting. Now, this group was really heavily into blood sacrifices. I'll get more into that in part two. Unfortunately, I don't like talking about that stuff, but we're going to have to talk about that in more detail in part two. But they did find a lot of bodies of dead dogs in Untermeyer Park. And these bodies were obviously mutilated in the way that you would mutilate a body for ritualistic purposes. Like it wasn't just a natural death. 
We also know that there has been speculation of missing children being found in this park. All that kind of stuff. And we do know that David Berkowitz did describe the satanic cult as being very, very violent. Now, if you remember from the Son of Sam case, originally David Berkowitz did blame the killings on a dog. He said that his neighbor, whose name was Sam, owned a dog that was possessed by a demon that told Berkowitz to do these killings. And then we find all these remains of these obviously sacrificed dogs in Untermeyer Park. There is a reason for that. And that reason is going to come more in part three with the Process Church. But Science. for part one, to conclude, what you need to know is that based on Mari Terry's research, based on a lot of other people's research since then, based on David Berkowitz's own confession in the mid-90s, the Son of Sam murder wasn't just some random serial killer. The Son of Sam murders were part of a bigger picture. These were ritualistic killing, killings of innocent people ordered by the higher-ups in a satanic cult. This satanic cult is not just an obscure French cult of derelict people in New York City, but it is a, 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 an offshoot a, a organization in New York City that's connected to a worldwide web of the same cult doing the same thing around the world. This cult connects also to Charles Manson and the family, and of course, Scientology. This cult runs deep within our governmental systems and has factions in neighborhoods all over the world. And once more, I want to give a special, special shout out to my friend, Doug Kramer, my late friend, Doug Kramer, for being the one to really push this out into the mainstream narrative for us to look at. I will be tagging Doug's channel and spe more specifically his series raised in a secret society down in the description box below so you can go ahead and check out his research and then join me next week for part two as we look even deeper into his research and the son of sam killings